Hello, and welcome back for lecture four. We're actually going to cover chapters four and five today. Um, so let's get started. You'll see they're all going to interconnect, uh, so it'll, it'll make sense. So let's get started. Chapter four is following the data. So we want to primarily talk about data. We're going to look into data modeling, how we use that as a technique to organize our data. We're going to look into some simple data modeling techniques. Um, and then we're going to talk about why data scientists need to have these data models. So let's go ahead and get started. First, it's important for us to understand the existing data source. The, the critical starting point for any project is to follow the data. In order to be able to improve upon a data system, so say you want to improve efficiency, you're going to have to really understand what's going on from all angles. Okay, you're going to start by thinking of all the processing steps and follow that through the data along their the data's journey. Um, things such as detail of content format, senders, receivers, etc., all of that stuff is going to help you get those answers that you're looking for. But what are the questions? So following the data involves asking yourself all sorts of questions, such as where does the data go? Um, is the data changed? Is it added to? How is that data transmitted? What is the security once it's transmitted? Um, is the data processed? And if it is, how many steps are there in the processing? And what are those steps? Uh, how is it used at any of the destinations? And, and all other sorts of questions that will give you sort of the understanding of how the data became what it is and if it went through any kind of processes. The data model is what is going to help you follow that data. Data modeling provides the theories, the strategies, the tools to help you follow that data. So in the 1970s, Ed Yerdon started this whole data modeling practice with something called a data flow diagram. Basically, this is a very early ancestor to an ERD uh, that you'll find used in databases today. Most people understand what an ERD is, but we're going to look into an ERD in a lot more detail. So let's take an example of an ERD. Um, let's look at a doctor-patient relationship. The doctor and the patient themselves are both objects, okay? They have a bi-directional relationship. The doctor's getting something from the patient. The patient is getting things from the doctor. Around them are going to be additional objects, such as nurses, insurance companies, um, suppliers. All of these objects as well are going to have relationships. Your ERD is going to represent all of these objects and their relationships. Now, while an ERD might have a really vast scope, Okay, they do eventually have to be detailed enough to be able to sort through objects in your database. So let's look at a quick example of an ERD. Maybe you've seen something like this, you know, it's in database. Um, this is actually a database uh, representation of an ERD. Each of those rectangles is going to show your object, okay? In the end, each one of those rectangles is going to become a table in a database. Okay, it within that object, the object has attributes. Okay, so say a patient, your patient's gonna have a patient ID and a name. Okay, the same thing with a provider, your providers or your doctor's gonna have an ID and a name. Now, the relationship between these objects are gonna be those lines with the arrows. Okay, so those lines and arrows are gonna show who and how. So now the big question is why, okay? Why do we need these data models? So data scientists often have to work with existing data rather than data that they have collected and organized themselves, okay? It's really important to understand the data models and the systems so you have as much understanding about this data you're being handed as possible. This is gonna give you the tools to better organize and work with it. 
So let's now get into chapter five. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some of these ideas and we're actually going to implement them into actual tables in R. So chapter five, we're going to start off by talking about rows and columns. We're looking at basic table structure, a 2D table structure with rows and columns. So now that we know what data models are, we're going to look at a data frame. Okay. Uh, and we're going to look at how that's used to organize data. We're going to do some coding. I'm going to do some examples here in lecture and learn how to create data frames using R. Then we're going to learn how to access the columns in the data frame and learn some additional functionality in R as well, like mins and maxes and sums. It'll be fun. It'll be great. So let's get going. The most common method of data organization is a two-dimensional organization of a table. Tables can be found in um, Word documents. They can be, you can use an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, tables are going to use those rows and columns to organize the data into some kind of grouping. Typically, the horizontal rows are going to be your cases or instances, and the vertical columns are going to be your attributes or your values. There's a lot of different interchangeable terms here. Computer scientists use the terms attributes and instances, while statisticians are going to use variables or cases. We're talking about the same thing. So either is fine as long as you're consistent and you understand what they mean. So your columns are going to contain the same type of information all the way through the column up and down. Okay, so say for example, we have a column called age. That age column is only going to have numbers, okay? We can have a name column, and that column is only gonna have strings and names. Each column is gonna have to have the same number of entries, okay? So you want your rows to be complete as you go down. Let's take a look at in R, and let's implement some of these ideas. So I somehow screwed up my sound when I was recording my screen, so I'm gonna try voiceover. So I apologize in advance, just gonna say that. So go ahead and start your R program, get it ready to go. And we're gonna do a little bit of a review from last time on creating some of these vectors and how to store them into variables. Let's start by creating a vector of my family names. So let's call it my family names. Give it the assignment operator, the less than and dash. And then we're gonna type a C for combine, the parentheses. And then let's put some names in quotes. So let's start out, we're gonna put dad, mom, sis, bro, and dog. Okay, we hit that enter key and it's gonna give us that command prompt back saying that it's ready for its next command. Now, remember, if you'd like to check the contents of my family names, all you have to do is type that variable name into the command prompt and it'll output all of the items in that vector. So let's try and do that. We can see here it displays that line number and then the five names that we put. Now you also can access um, individual items, but we're going to see that here in a minute. Now, names in quotes are going to be strings of characters, and just know that if you don't have quotes, it's the going to be treated as like a storage location or as a variable. So let's create a few more vectors. We're going to create a vector of my family ages. We're going to do the assignment statement, then combine, and let's do 43, 42, 12, eight, and five. Okay, remember again, you check those contents by putting in the variable name and hitting enter, and they look great. Now let's 
access a single element of this vector. In order to do that, we're going to use square brackets. So we type the variable name and then put the square brackets and then the element number we want to see. So let's look at element two, which is going to give us the second from the left. And so it should display 42. So when we press the enter again, it gives us the line number one and the actual answer display of the number 42. Let's create two more vectors, my family genders, and we do the assignment, we'll do our combine, and let's say uh, male, female, female, male, and dog. We're not gonna gender our dog. I feel like that's appropriate, right? Okay, we hit enter, and we're gonna check and make sure it loaded the way that we anticipate. Then we're going to do one more. Finally, let's do my family weights. We're going to do the assignment statement, the C for combine. And let's say 200, 200, 100, 125. And then again, let's print that out to make sure it did what we thought. There we can see it did hold the values for those weights as we anticipated. Now R will, if you run out of room going with side to side, it will put a plus at um, the end of one of the lines. Just know that that is just meaning it is a wrap. It is not a command. So if you do get that, um, we won't get that now, but maybe later on down the road. So on to the next. In R, uh, data frame is a list of columns. Okay, so we talked about a list. You're basically making a list of lists. Okay, so each of your columns is going to be considered a list. Each element in your list is a vector. Okay, all vectors have to have the same length that keeps that continuity. And each vector is going to have its own name. So let's take a quick look at this in R. In R, we are going to use a command that is data.frame with parentheses around it. That's going to be the function that's going to make your data frame from your vectors. Okay, so let's make a data frame object named my family with all of the vectors that we just previously created. So in order to do that, we're going to type my family. We're going to use the assignment operator as we did before. But instead of using C for combine, what we're going to say is data dot frame and then our parentheses. OK, inside of the parentheses, what we're going to do is we're going to list all of those vectors that we want to be columns of this data frame. OK, so we're going to list my family names, my family ages, my family genders and my family weights. Now, when we hit the enter key, it's going to bring us back to that command prompt, but let's go ahead and check our object to make sure it has the desired information that we want in it. So we do this just like we do with the vectors and we're going to type my family and hit the enter key. What you can see displayed here in kind of a table format is your data series. So here's your data frame. You've got each column is going to be one of your vectors. You've got row numbers that it starts out with. And you see how we've got dad, mom, sis, and then you've got the ages. You've got all of the genders listed and you have the family weights. Now, this is nice and easy and it's a small data set, but a lot of times you will be working with larger data sets. So one of the things you can do is you can get some information about the data set and not necessarily the data. So we use the str command in order to reveal what the actual data frame structure is going to look like. 
So we type str parentheses and we put the variable name of the data frame and then hit the enter key. Okay, first thing is gonna, that it's gonna show is that my family is in fact a data frame. It has five observations or cases or instances and four different variables available to it. Okay, str is even gonna reveal the mode of those variables in the output right after the colon that names the variable. Okay, so you've got the variable and it says character, it says num, I'm a little bit ahead of the screen, but that's okay. It says character, it says num, and it, it tells you what it is. Now, you can get a summary, which is going to be similar to the str, but it's gonna give you more information. Summary is gonna reorganize that data frame in the output, okay? Let's do summary and then put the, the variable name you can see here the output completely different. It does give each column, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna explain to you what's in those columns, okay? So for the first one, it says my family names. It is a character. There is a length involved. Um, and the same that goes with family genders. But you can see how that compares to the numerics that are being used for ages and weights. The ages and weights are gonna give you some additional information like the minimum, the maximum, mean, median, all of that kind of stuff. So it is gonna give you more information regarding what is in the data frame as far as the data goes. Okay, let's look at some of the various uh, commands that are available to us using R. We're gonna look at min, which is gonna give a minimum or a lowest value the first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartal, or the maximum or highest value. Let's take this group of new commands and let's put them in R and let's see what happens. Last but not least, let's take a look at um, exploring the data frame and how we can recall some specific information. So to look at certain rows, we can use head it's going to automatically give us five as a default, or we can specify how many we want to show it. So if we say head, my family, two, it's going to give us the top two. Conversely, there is a tail. That's going to give us the last five rows, as we can see here. It, again, if you want to go ahead and put the two, it's going to give you the last two rows. So. How are we gonna access the stored variables? R stores the data frame as a list of vectors. Um, and even though it may look like a vector, it's completely a different data object because it's within the data frame, okay? The individual vector can be manipulated by itself, but the object of my family dollar sign, my family ages is gonna remain the same even if the vector is changed, okay? That vector is no longer the identical um, vector in the data frame. The data frame has its own quote unquote version of it. Okay, so if we were to add an observation or if we were to change a value, okay, we can change it in my family ages and it would be in that vector. But in order to change it in the table, we would have to say my family dollar sign, my family ages. Okay. We don't want to add anything because it's going to mess up our pretty rectangle, but that would be how you would change something within the data frame itself. Okay, that is all there is for lecture today. Let's take a quick look at the assignment and the lab. Now the assignment, we're just going to do some initial data analysis. We're going to look for a few things. We're going to pull out a few columns. There is a data set already built into R, okay? And is, I think it's like empty cars or something. It's actually kind of a cool data set. Um, so what you're gonna do is pull out some of these maxes and mins, figure out which car has the best horsepower, which one gets the best miles per gallon. Um, so basically, I just want you to manipulate that data frame and be able to access specific information, okay? Now, on the other hand, the lab, um, it's gonna walk you through and ask you to do a few different steps. Again, you're gonna be using that same data set that we used for the assignment, um, and you're gonna collect some necessary data, and you're gonna add your own, you're gonna kinda of make your own um, data set, okay? So you're gonna create some vectors, you're going to make some like user IDs, 
Um, and again, you can just make up this information. That's fine. So for the assignment, uh, screenshots in a word are fine. Um, and the same thing for the lab. If you can't get your text file to upload, just take a screenshot. So good luck, happy coding, and I'm always here if you need me. Shoot me an email.